Hi. Hi. All right. We're going to change things up just slightly. We're going to start both. Um, we're going to start with announcements this morning or this evening, whatever time it is. These three teaching opportunities a day Sundays begin to <laughs> throw me just ever so slightly, but ah, uh, so welcome. Um, it's hot. Yeah. It's miserable. But we're see, we're here. We're in the air conditioning. We're going to continue in this series of seeing Jesus in the Old Testament, exactly what he told those two guys on the road to Emmaus, which when I opened this series was that of all the sermons that Jesus gave, I wish that one would have been recorded. To hear him go through the Old Testament step by step and say, this points to me and this points to me and this is where I was. And you can see me here, but... You know, we have the Holy Spirit, we have God's written word, and he says, go find it, start digging, it's there. So, I wanted to open up out of um, Psalm 84 this evening, the first four verses. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of hosts. I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. Even a sparrow finds a home, and a swallow a nest for herself where she places her young near your altars, Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How happy are those who reside in your house, who praise you continually. What a gorgeous opening to that psalm, but also a good reminder of, of everybody wants this thing about happiness. And scripture says, if you want to be happy, get into the house of the Lord. Be glad that you're there everything that goes on in the house of the Lord. So, by way of announcements, um, we are doing our annual July Praying for America, so if you got one of the bulletins this morning, this insert was in it for the week. There was only a few left, they're sitting back there, you can get one of these inserts with their prayer suggestions for the week as we traditionally in July is when we pray for our country. We should be praying for our country all the time, but this is kind of an extra emphasis month, so you can get one of those as well. Um, this Thursday, we have a, what is it, a five-person team, Cindy, that's heading for the Czech Republic? It is, but we are also going with a team from Kingwood Baptist in Texas. So there's okay. eight of them, so the total team will be, what is that, 13? Good. So, and if anybody wants to know what they're doing, they're working at a English learner's camp but they use the Bible as their English for the people to be learning. So we obviously don't know the hearts and mind condition of these people here. They're trying to learn English and they're gonna learn English by learning God's word. What a great opportunity. Also remember, and I was corrected because I'm old. It is no longer Czechoslovakia. It is the Czech. Czech it is the Czech Republic. Czech Republic. Sorry. And the only reason I know is because we've been getting coached on the culture. Yes. <laughs> so when you're praying for the team, you know, God's still going to know if you call it Czechoslovakia. Yeah, he's going to know right where they are and what they're doing. But keep them in prayer. They're flying out on Thursday, right? Correct. So they'll be over there for a, a number of days. Uh, ladies Fellowship Night, the Christmas in July, is coming up this Friday the 14th with a, a potluck. Um, I would not suggest that you ladies dress like it's Christmas in July. <laughs> Why not? No worries. Unless, you know, you want the, the ugly sweater on at 115 and knock yourself out. Um, the 23rd, we're having a, and it's going to be, at my understanding, I could be wrong, where it says business meeting, we're going to change the name of it slightly. It's there's going to be technically a business meeting that's going to be on and off the table instantly so that we can record at on our quarterly meetings that we voted to do. And then we're going to go into what we're going to call a family meeting. So it's going to be just a time to talk as a family to bring up issues like, I don't know how your family would work. Every once in a while we would call a family gathering and say, okay, let's talk about what's going on, what everybody's doing. So it's going to be kind of a little more loose as we talk about it 
unless there are some things that have to be voted on, but I'm just not aware of that at this point. So, what's that? Nomination committee. Yeah. Trying to have nominations for a couple things. So that may there there may be, but that that formal business meeting will be on and off the table, hopefully relatively quickly, and then we're just going to have a discussion of where we are as a church, where we're going, what's going on. What's happening? Because what we don't want is the rumor mill floating around out there everywhere. So we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to come in here. Here's what we're doing. Here's what's going on. Here's who's doing what. Because obviously we've had some major changes occur. Um, and so that's leaving people nervous because people like things to be very staid, exactly the same. And so we want to share everything where we're going. Yes, Chris. I'm sorry, let me interrupt, but in addition to the ladies' side, we're collecting things to make the senior citizens um, toiletry bags right. in conjunction with the food. So. And that list I did not bring over, but there were some of the list of that. You can see, Chris, if you want to get in on that between now and, and Friday. It's on the website, too. It's on the website. Even better. Um, blood drive. That's been a big part of our church's outreach to the community for a long time. We need a coordinator. Um, remember my Sunday morning series is about giving. <laughs> this is a place that somebody could give, particularly if God has provided you with the time and talent of organizational skills. This is a turnkey operation. It's all set. You don't have to invent anything. You don't have to do anything new. You just have to be the person that follows through deals with my talent, calls, you know, email and calls the people. It, the whole process is there. We just need somebody that's willing to, uh, every eight weeks, it's not even a, a weekly or a, even a monthly ministry. It's kind of every other month of doing that. So if that's something that you're thinking about, please let the office know. Does that have to be on Thursday night? Does that have to be on Thursday? Yeah, so it, it, we are a little locked in, no, we're on because of their schedule, yeah, not ours. You have to be here from um, about like a quarter to two to seven, so the children will want somebody here. Okay. Only because we have people from the neighborhood coming in, we want somebody to greet them from Levine Baptist Church. Yeah, it's kind of like a welcoming to our church, you know. Yeah, so it, it's more like a ministry. It is. It is. It is. It is. And it's doing something for the community. So okay. keep that one um, in mind. Do I mind. need to make that type of announcement on a Sunday morning? I am going to. Maybe yeah, I, <laughs> I, I plan on that, of giving a little more information on that, because we just had one, so we've got some time to bring somebody on board. Um, kind of looking over the rest of it, uh, the Ladies Weekly Bible Study starts this coming Monday, or tomorrow. At 8 a.m., Jonah, Nahum, and Habakkuk. Uh, I may try to sneak in on that last part because Habakkuk's one of my favorite books of the Old Testament. There's some incredible stuff in there. Uh, men's Retreat coming up in, in October. Other things, read, read your bulletin. Um, but the church is going. The church is continuing. And to kind of go with, with the message this morning, because I've heard from some people that says, you know, I'm out of here or I'm thinking about leaving. Mm -hmm. This is not the time to leave, this is the time to get to work. Mm -hmm. And for the, for the membership to begin to do the work, which should always have been the case. And because then your heart will follow with that. And people will see that. But I'm not preaching now, I'm giving announcements. <laughs> so with that, let me pray and we'll turn over and do some singing. Harry? Yes. I think we all failed. I did. I meant to include in prayer this morning that we remember Sharon. Oh, yes. Yeah. She's, she's not doing well right now. Yeah, Sharon Olson, um, Cindy and, and her have been in contact quite a bit over this, this whole series of issues. Um, and we heard from Paul. She had a very adverse reaction to her treatment 
was put into the hospital and even Paul can't go in to see her without putting on PPEs. So she's in, she's in dire straits. But our God is still in charge. He knows every cell in her body. But we need to keep her and Paul, who's going through all of this, um, in, in prayer so that uh, they walk out of there with just some kind of a screaming testimony that you know does nothing but bring thanks to God. So, thank you. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh, we, say, we say thank you for all of your blessings. They, they, are with, they are innumerable. We could spend the rest of our lives speaking what your blessings were and we would, we would run out of time. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for this building. We thank you for the invention of air conditioning that makes a 110-day in Phoenix bearable. But, Father God, we thank you most for the ability to gather together freely to hear your word, to worship you, to jointly come together as a family from many different backgrounds and everything else as one people before one God to say thank you. So Father God, we say thank you. We say thank you for Sharon and Paul, what a great ministry they've been in our family for years. Father God, we, we're asking for your hand of mercy in this situation. But even more so than that, we ask that your name be praised in this situation. To us, it looks impossible. But you are a God to whom everything is possible. So, Father God, we commend Paul and his heart and his strength and his mind as he's dealing with the stress of his spouse in this situation. Father, I know as, as, a, as a man and a husband, my job is to protect my wife. And we get in situations like that and we find that we are powerless. So I pray for Paul. Father, I pray for his wife as she's dealing with this life-destroying disease. But Father God, you have her in the palm of your hand. You know every cell in her body. You know where every cancer cell is. And so Father God, we're turning over all of that to you. We're asking for her healing because we don't know what your plan is. But Father God, we, we bow at your throne. Offer Sharon up, your child, into your hands. Ask for her healing that she may be rejoined to us as a family. But Father God, whatever your plan is, let your name be praised. For that is what is important. We thank you for all of this. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, church. Uh, so we have the numbers of the songs we'll be singing up to your left. 3545. Right. 199. <laughs> I, thought I, were, I thought God was sending me my lottery ticket numbers, but then we changed it, and now that was not from God. I won't have one again. But let's try, uh, let's sing. Page 35 of this hang on. Okay. We're using this one. And let me scoot back.
right, for my next one, I'm going to invite Miss Cindy and Miss Chris and Mr. Andy to come over here. Come on, Cindy. Come on, Chris. Come on, Andy. This one is a new one for me, so I'm trying to learn it. It's page 45 when a serving the wondrous cross. Come on. He wants to play cards, that's why I think. continue now in our series of finding Jesus in the Old Testament and we're finally going to get out of Genesis. Although I probably could have done the entire series just in the book of Genesis because we've skipped over all kinds of people and things but I'm, I'm trying to make this an actual Jesus in the Old Testament by something more than just Genesis. But we've seen him a lot. One of my favorite meals is a well roasted turkey. And I mean the whole bird, all of it. 
Of course, this is common fare for Thanksgiving and Christmas, but I like having them throughout the year. And I want the biggest one that I can afford. I'm in charge of buying the turkey every year for Thanksgiving because one year I allowed my wife to buy it and I, I accused her of buying a Cornish game hen. It was still a turkey, but because not only do I like turkey, I like turkey leftovers. I mean everything. Cold turkey sandwiches, turkey enchiladas, oh yeah. Um, turkey and rice soup, all the other things that my wife creates with the leftovers is what I, I mean, I want that turkey dinner and the gravy and the potatoes and all that stuff, but I want all that leftover stuff. I kind of looked that up about how many turkeys the U.S. produces. The, we produce somewhere north, well north of 200 million turkeys. 200 million, that's a lot of birds. Annually, our friends in England chip in for about another 10 million birds just around Christmas. That's a lot of turkeys. And all, every one of those turkeys, when they hatch, are born under a death sentence. They are born to die. They have a death sentence from the moment they are hatched. When I was over in Texas visiting my daughter for the birth of my grandson a couple of months ago, they were hatching some turkeys to go along with all the other animals they have on their, their little ranch, which I know a lot of people at, my, at the church here follow Whitney and her Three Queens Ranch and all of the death and destruction that continues to happen when you're raising animals. But here, here came, and now I've seen pictures and the turkeys are now looking like turkeys in just a couple of months. It's, it's kind of amazing. Those turkeys have it good. They're not born under a death sentence. They're designed to hang around and just be turkeys eating bugs in the yard and to have be fun, to have, yes, we have turkeys. As tonight, as we're moving out of Genesis and entering the book of Exodus, we're going to focus on another of the big names in the Bible, the central character of the book of Exodus, which is Moses, who was born under a death sentence. And we're going to see Jesus right there in the birth and initial stages of Moses, and we're going to find Jesus again. And you'll see a lot of comparisons that we begin to draw between Moses, the, the, the hero, if you would, of Exodus, and Jesus. So let's see how we can see Jesus in the Old Testament one more time in the story of Moses' birth, just his birth and his beginnings. So first off, he's born under a sentence, and we are in high technology this evening. We're going to figure out how to use this equipment, but for now, we're going to use mine. So we're going to start in Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra, the other Pua, when you help the Hebrew women give birth, observe them as they deliver. If the child is a son, kill him. But if it's a daughter, she may live. The Hebrew midwives, however, feared God, and they did, and did not do as the king of Egypt told them. They let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this and let the boys live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, the Hebrew women are just not like Egyptian women. Ah, they're tough. So they are vigorous and give birth before a midwife can get to them. So God was good to the midwives and the people multiplied and became very numerous. Since the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Pharaoh then commanded all his people, you must throw every son born of the Hebrews into the Nile, but let every daughter live. So Moses is born under a death decree. Pharaoh is having a problem. As we read in our opening passage, 
the Pharaoh at this particular time, who apparently wasn't a real student of history, or he would have known what the Jews had meant to the saving of his own people, he begins to feel threatened by the growing number of Hebrews living in Egypt. He surreptitiously orders the death of all the newborn Hebrew boys at the hands of midwives, but that didn't work out so well. Again, kind of going back to my daughter over in Texas, we were there for the birth. We had scheduled it. Usually Whitney is, well, she's always fast. When I say fast, I mean like, oh, I'm having a baby. Boom, here it is. None of this hours and hours of, of stuff. So her due date was about a week or so before we got there. And we thought, okay, we're going to get there after the baby's born and then kind of help her with this brand new baby and do stuff for her. But we got there. And we're there for a couple of days. And she began to freak out. Oh, you're going to have to leave. I'm not having this baby. And then Saturday morning rolls around. She's, going to have, she's planning on having the baby with a midwife at a birthing center. She calls us early in the morning and says, I, I'm feeling the contractions. You better head this way. I jump, Cindy says, jump in the shower real quick. I jump in the shower. I'm getting out. And Whitney calls and says, my water just broke. Come straight here. Absolutely. So we're down out of our hotel in the car and flying down the highway to her house. Just as we leave the little town of Decatur, heading on the highway, it's about a 10 or 15 minute drive out into the country where she lives, we get another phone call from Nick saying, he's here. <laughs> we got there. His car is running, the doors are open because he was preparing to grab his three daughters, load them up and take Whitney to the birthing center. But before, as, as he's loading them up and he comes back in, and I've got this picture of Whitney holding up her son in the bathtub. <laughs> he's here. We beat, the, we beat the midwife. By the time the midwife got there, Everything is obviously done. Um, and so there was my grandson, born without the midwife, just there. That's what these ladies are claiming, that the Hebrew women are like my daughter Whitney. Man, when it's time to have that baby, we, we can't even get there before they, before they have the birth. So now what does he resort to? He resorts to government intervention and he orders all the newborn Hebrew boys thrown into the Nile River. And if you read it here, it says he's speaking to all of his people. This is a decree going out to everybody. If you know of a Hebrew baby, you make sure that thing is drowned. A Hebrew baby boy. This is something we see repeated throughout time that earthly governments will stand in opposition to God and his plan and will foolishly try to enact laws and decrees against it. Our own country has tried that. Stand by, they're gonna try it some more. They can enact all the laws and decrees against God's plan that they want, but they've, they've gone in opposition against a power that they can't even begin to understand. Amen. So Moses' birth happens, but his mother has a plan. Turn on over to Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now a man from the family of Levi married a Levite woman. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with asphalt and pitch. She placed the child in it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. Then his sister stood at a distance in order to see what would happen to him. So his mom has a plan. She's given birth. She's defied the government decree. And she does what she can for three months. But the first thing we learn about Moses is he's a really pretty baby. Says he's beautiful. Now, I'm talking to a number of moms in here. Most moms think their kid is gorgeous. That's just a thing moms do. 
It's not always the case. <laughs> My son, who is a strapping former Marine, now Army Sergeant, currently serving over in, in Romania when he's not playing Avondale police officer, was not a good looking baby. He was red, squalling, and a mess. And I learned a nurse term. I learned the term precious, which is nurse for, oh. <laughs> oh, isn't he precious? Okay, I need to go somewhere. Moses was beautiful. Scripture says so. This is one good looking baby. And his mom does what she can to take care of him. So she defies Pharaoh's order, tries hiding him for three months until that becomes impossible. It's one thing to hide a newborn. It's whole another thing to hide a three month old kid. They're making their wants known. They're much more of a handful even than that brand new newborn. And so she complies with the order of Pharaoh. Sort of. <laughs> Does she throw him in the Nile? Yeah. Yes, she does. Does she happen to get a papyrus basket, coat the inside with stuff that won't let any water in, and then not put him out in the current, but put him back in the reeds? Yes, she does. My guess is she might have been thinking something like, okay, God, I'm doing what I was told. I'm obeying the government like I was told. Now I'm depending on you to protect my son, my beautiful son. This is one good looking boy. Father God, you gave him to me, but the king said, put him in the Nile, I'm putting him in the Nile. And then he posts his sister, who we later learned her name later is Miriam, to stand off in the distance and watch to see what will happen. And what happens? Of course, this is one of the best known Bible stories. Anybody that's taught kids Bible school or Sunday school, You've all done Moses. You've all done baby Moses in the basket. You've made the little pictures for the kids to take home. He's found and rescued. We're going to move on to verse 5 through 10. Pharaoh's daughter went down to bathe at the Nile while her servant girls walked along the riverbank. Seeing the basket among the reeds, she sent her slave girl to get it. When she opened it, she saw the child, a little boy, crying. She felt sorry for him and said, this is one of the Hebrew boys. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, should I, uh, should I go get, call a woman from the Hebrews to nurse the boy for you? This is one sharp girl. She's thinking. Go, Pharaoh's daughter told her. So the girl went and called the boy's mother. <laughs> then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child, nurse him for me, and I will pay your wages, the wages for a wet nurse. I'm going to pay you to take care of your own son. I love the way God works stuff. So the woman took the boy and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. So Moses is found and rescued in God's perfect providence Pharaoh's daughter and her entourage come down to bathe in the river, see the basket, find the baby crying. She recognized that he was a Hebrew. We don't know how she recognized it, but he is a boy. He is three months old. And if and they are Levites, if he's following the law, what has happened to this boy? He's been circumcised. A lot of Bible scholars think that that may have been what she saw when she saw this baby. Oh, this is a Hebrew. I can tell right off. We don't know that. That's that is supposition. All it says is she knew that he was a Hebrew. If you watch the Cecil B. DeMille movie, he's wrapped in a cloth that has the blue and white edging to it, and they recognize him from the cloth. That's as plausible a story as, as any. But she said, this is a Hebrew boy. She knows what her father has decreed, but she sees a crying three-month-old little boy, and her compassion comes out. Enter his sister, one sharp young lady who offers to get a Hebrew woman. <laughs> I'll go get just some random Hebrew woman, princess, to nurse the boy for her. She makes the assumption 
Miriam makes the assumption that the princess was going to keep the boy. We don't see any of that in the act of the princess at this point. But she makes the assumption, shall I go get somebody to nurse him for you? And now all of a sudden you can almost see the wheels turn in her head. Oh, nurse it for me. Yes. Yes. I can have a son. Yes. The gods, I know what she would have been thinking. The gods have provided me a son right there in the Nile. And the Nile meant everything to the Egyptians. Of course, she gets Moses' own mother, who's now going to be paid to nurse and raise the baby for Pharaoh's daughter. Then when he's weaned, Moses is taken to live in the palace of the most powerful kingdom of the time. See, God overrides the schemes of the evil one. We know from Daniel, the book of Daniel, that Satan has demonic influencers working in governments around the planet. Well, you can read that right in the story of Daniel. Nothing has changed, by the way. His evil influencers are at work in our government, halls of government, as much as they are in China and Russia and Argentina and every place else. But God overrides what they're trying to do. It's easy to make the assumption that the whole death of the Hebrew males was yet another attempt by Satan and his forces to frustrate what God had said. I am going to bless the entire world through Adam's seed. So if I can kill off all the males, I'll kill off the Jews. So Hitler and his minions weren't anything new. This has been tried before. Because Abraham said, or the promise to Abraham was that through him, Genesis twenty two eighteen, 18, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring. So God, in honoring his promise to Abraham, says, no, I'm protecting, and watch me work. Charles Henry McIntosh, a, a name that I know just rolls off the tongue for most of you, he was a Scottish theologian in the mid to late 1800s. In looking at this story, said this. The devil was foiled by his own weapon. His weapon was to throw boys into the Nile. He's foiled by his own plan. He said, yes, I'm, I'm going to influence Pharaoh to make this crazy decree. This will get him. ha <laughs> ha. And God says, okay, that's your plan. Watch me work. I'm going to take your plan and I'm going to put my hero in the Nile. And he's going to be raised now in Pharaoh's household. McIntosh goes on to say, Inasmuch as Pharaoh, whom he was using to frustrate the purpose of God, is used of God to nourish and bring up Moses, who was to be his instrument in confounding the power of Satan. So Macintosh, I said 100 and what, 140 years ago now, looked at this story and got it right. He <laughs> said, man, God uses Satan's own plan to bring up his hero. We have to remember that only God is omniscient. Only God is all-knowing. Satan is not. Satan makes plans and he has no idea how they will turn out because he is not all-knowing. None of the demons, none of the angels know what is going to happen. That's why the angels stand in amazement at things happening. They're as surprised as we are. Satan can make all of these devious plans and he's, all he can do is hope that they turn out the way he figured. Now he tells the same lie over and over again because it works really well. But when he makes these big plans to frustrate God, he doesn't know if they're going to work, and here it doesn't work again. Moses was born to be a savior. The child who had been doomed to death by Pharaoh's decree was destined to be the very instrument of Pharaoh's destruction. So that, as it says repeatedly in the book of Exodus, they will know that I am the Lord their God. God frustrates Satan's plan for the purpose of people knowing who he is. 
God's plan was that Moses was to be his instrument to save his people from their bondage in Egypt and take them back to the promised land that he'd shown to Abraham and to show the rest of the world just who he is. So that's a great story. So many of you that worked with kids, you've told that story. You've made the crafts. You've sent home the little baskets, all that stuff. But we're seeing Jesus in this. A number of you are probably already beginning to see Jesus. See, Moses was a savior, but he wasn't the savior. He was a prototype of the savior that God had promised way back in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve. The, the, this promise in Genesis 3.15, I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will strike your head, you will strike his heel. That is known as the Proto-Evangelium. Yes, there will be a test later. <laughs> this is the first promise to mankind of a Savior. And here is God showing that picture in Moses again. This, this promise, the first time that God promises a Savior, we see that the promise that God has, has always he's always had a plan. Right from day one. He's never caught off guard. He never has to formulate a plan B, if you would. God doesn't have to go, oh, all right, well, then we'll do. His plan is his plan, and it doesn't change. It doesn't move. It doesn't waver nothing. 1 Peter 1, 19 to 21. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish, he was chosen before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of times for you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. From the beginning of time. This was God's plan. He tells it to Adam and Eve. Remember what was the sentence for Adam and Eve for eating from the one tree? There was only one tree they weren't able to eat from. It was death. He said, you will surely die. And Satan has his whole lie and questions God and all that sort of stuff. But now when God gives him that promise, known as the, that proto evangelion that first promise that you are going, that I'm going to make a, a way out, Eve gets her name. If you study scripture, everybody refers to her as Adam and Eve. She's not Eve until this. Her name is not Eve until after the fall. Her name is not Eve until God makes a promise. Because in Adam and Eve's mind, they were dead people walking. And God says, here's my promise. They're gonna strike that serpent's gonna strike his heel and he's gonna crush that head. Adam believes God. That's the only word from God that he had. And he names his wife Eve. If you know what her name means, it's the mother of all living. Adam now knew he was going to live because of God's promise. His faith in God's word was the faith that ended up saving Adam. He didn't have all of this God's word that we have. He had one promise, and he said, I believe that, and we know he believed it because he turns to his, his woman, <laughs> that was her name, woman, and says, your name is Eve. You are the mother of all living because what God just said, we are going to live. He's got a plan. Jesus is the Savior, the coming one, promised to Adam and Eve way back in Genesis 3.15. Moses was a designated savior to his people. Listen to Hebrews 3.3. 3. For Jesus is considered worthy of more glory than Moses. That was almost blasphemy to the Jews. Moses was the guy. He's the one that brought us out. The writer of, to the book of, of Hebrews says that Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder has more honor than the house itself. While things that are made can be really awe-inspiring, I love looking at architecture, really, you know, I love going to Europe, seeing these great cathedrals and castles, and um, I even like going back east, um, seeing some of the old buildings there. I went down in one 
building and it was handmade brick. You know it was handmade brick because there were fingerprints, finger marks in the brick from when it was soft and they were forming it. And that building had been built in somewhere in the 1700s and the tour guide was showing us, look, you can see the fingerprints of the brick maker in that. So I love looking at this architecture stuff. It can be very awe-inspiring, but you have to remember who should get the praise for that. The person who built it. We see the Frank Lloyd Wright buildings here in Arizona. They can be very awe-inspiring. I love to go see some of the plays over at uh, Gamage. It's a very interesting looking theater. But you have to think, who built that? Who designed that? That's the person who should be, who should be praised. So the writer of Hebrews is speaking here in the forming of the Christian church. His meaning is that Jesus, who formed the Christian church, is more honorable or a greater person than all the members of the church collectively. He's consequently greater than any particular member of it, including the pastor. Or the head of the deacons. Or anybody else. You've got to look at the builder, and Jesus is the builder of this church. Some of those people may have raised money for a building, implemented a series of programs that entice people in the doors, but the builder and designer of the church is Jesus. And that's who gets the praise for Levine Baptist Church and for the church as it exists globally. He's the builder. Like Moses, Jesus too was also born and under a death sentence. Remember his birth story, Herod the Great felt threatened about the prophecies of a coming king of the Jews being born in Bethlehem, so he ordered the death of all the baby boys in the region, not just in the little village of, Abra of, of Bethlehem, but in the entire area. He threw a wide net, kill them all. I don't know where this little boy is, I want them all dead. But like Moses, he was saved from the slaughter. He was born to save his people and nothing could stop God's plan. If you know the story well, Joseph, Mary, the toddler, Jesus escaped to somewhere in Egypt. We don't know exactly where it just says Egypt. Um, I've kind of studied that out. The nearest Egyptian village from Bethlehem was only around 40, 50 miles away. It could have been there. We don't know. But he goes into the land of Egypt to escape the control area of Herod. In recounting this story, Matthew applied the statement about the exodus of the children of Israel in Hosea 11.1, 1, you can look that up at home later, to Jesus in Matthew 2.15. He stayed there until Herod's death so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, that would be Hosea, might be fulfilled, out of Egypt I called my son. Exactly like Moses, born under a death sentence, coming out of Egypt, saving his people, do you see that correlation? We can see Jesus in the Old Testament in the life of Moses, just in his birth. There's all kinds of other stories, and we're not going to stop there as well. We're going to go into other books of the Old Testament as we, as we continue this series during the summer. But just here in his birth, we see Jesus again. In his deliverance from a violent death in infancy and his years of quiet training, in his willingness to leave the palace of a king, to deliver his people from bondage, in his meekness, his faithfulness, his commitment to finish the work God gave him to do, Moses was a picture, a picture of the better savior that was coming. He gave the people kind of a living word picture of a Messiah that was coming that was really going to save them. But as a picture, Moses fell really short of the actual savior. <laughs> Moses sinned under provocation. Not that that's an excuse. Well, I was provoked. He murders an Egyptian over some harsh treatment of his fellow Israelites. Moses flashes that same temper a few other times during the story. If you know the story of the Exodus, Moses flashes that temper a couple of times. And it's one of those times that keeps him from going into the promised land. God says, okay, that's enough. You're done. But Jesus was without sin. 
Remember, Moses is just a prototype. We're seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. 1 John 3, 5. You know that he was revealed so that he might take away sins, and there is no sin in him. Not a little bit. Utterly and completely without sin. Not even a single wayward thought. Y'all ever had a couple of thoughts? Maybe while driving? That's when I have my wayward thoughts, usually. Plus, with my old career, I'm, I'm trying to find my, my white siren switch, and it's just not there in my minivan. <laughs> but Jesus doesn't even have a wayward thought. He is without sin. He has no sin. So while Moses is just a kind of a shadow precursor of this great Messiah to come, we can see that Jesus was already being evidenced. What was coming was all, God was already showing the people, this is what's coming. I'm going to give you somebody that's going to give you an idea. Moses was unable to bear the burdens of the people alone. He needed his brother and sister at the outset. Then later during the Exodus, he needed layers of administration. His father-in-law had to come along to him and say, dude, you're carrying too big a load. Set up under people under you that are over tens and over hundreds and over thousands, you know, and they can deal with all the little stuff and you deal with the big stuff. Moses was unable to bear the burdens of the people alone, but Jesus was able to die for all of the sins of all of his people. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. All of our sins. While Moses couldn't even bear the burden of somewhere around a million people, I say only bear the burden of a million people, Jesus steps up and bears the burden of sin for everybody that's ever drawn breath. Jesus is the better Savior. He alone bore the burden of punishment for the sins of all of humanity throughout time. There aren't any sins that God doesn't know about. There are no hierarchies of sin. Because they all result in the exact same thing, separation from God. I had a discussion with somebody on the phone recently who was reading through a passage in Scripture and talking the passage where it talks about people that were involved in this kind of crime and this kind of sin and this kind of, and it mentioned what um, homosexuals and it said such were some of were some of you and this person called me up and said well wait a minute I said look only mankind sees sin as and mainly that's because we want to feel better about myself Okay, I didn't do your sin, so I'm better. <laughs> I did my own. But the funny thing is, we, it all ends up in the same place. We all end up separated from God. God doesn't have a hierarchy of sin. We kind of have to, to administrate people. But God says, I have one standard, one standard only, and that's me, which is perfection. You meet that, or you're out. But boy, and Christians are horrible about this, about saying, oh, but look at your sin. <laughs> Moses was unable to bring the people into the promised land due to his sin and disobedience. But Jesus is able to bring all of us into a permanent promised land forever. Jude 24 and 25, as Jude closes his, his little one-chapter letter. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Christ Jesus our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. To him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory. That's something that Moses couldn't do. He could not go stand in the promised land. Jesus, who he prefigures, says, I'm 
better. I'm going to not only take bear the burdens of everybody, Moses, you can't even deal with a million people, watch me do with all people for all time, and I am going to bring them into the promised land with me. Moses couldn't do that. Tonight we've been able to see Jesus in the Old Testament. And every single book in the Old Testament points to Jesus. All of them. A couple of lucky guys walking on a road to Emmaus had Jesus come up and explain this. And I'm sure he explained it far better than I ever will be able to. But can you imagine walking along a road with the risen Jesus as he goes through all of what we call the Old Testament, story after story, he says, this points to me, this points to me. Baby Moses thrown into, under a sentence of death, just like I was. And just like I was, God says, I've got another plan coming. And in both times, he uses Egypt and says, I'm calling my son out of Egypt. I'm bringing my people out of Egypt. I'm bringing my son out, and he's going to save their people. But unlike that precursor guy who couldn't get the job done, who struggled with the job, Jesus, as he's talking, says, they points to me, and I'm getting the job done. You, if you believe in me, I'm bringing you into the promised land where you will live forever. Remember that according to Jesus himself, all of the Old Testament points to him. John 5, 39. You pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them. Yet they testify about me. And I'll tell you, any church, any pastor that doesn't mention Jesus in probably every sermon that he ever preaches has missed the point. Because this entire book, from Genesis 1-1, all the way through Revelation chapter 21, points to one guy and one guy only. He points to Jesus. And as we go through, finish out this, this series this summer, we're going to see Jesus again and again and again. Because if we look to anything else, if we look to Moses... If we just look to God's word instead of looking to Jesus, we're missing the point. And we, like the people in Exodus, tend to follow after and depend on earthly saviors. Whether they're political saviors, religious saviors, or something else. And we in the church are just as guilty as those people outside the church. Because when our savior, when our lead pastor... Our beloved guy who was here for 25 years leaves. All of a sudden, everybody's going, oh, what are we doing? What are... We're turning our face to the guy who built the building in the first place. Amen. And saying, it's not the building. It's not even the people in the building. It's the guy who built the building. That's who gets praise. We can look at Moses and dissect his life and learn all kinds of valuable lessons. And I, I absolutely would encourage you, that's a great Bible study, to just study the life of Moses. You could get in there and spend weeks, trust me, dissecting his life. But if we fail to see him as anything more than a prefigure of the actual Savior, we're going to miss the true application of his story. If we see him as anything other than the guy who God sends as a prefigure of the Messiah King to come, we're going to miss what Moses' life was all about. And if Moses could stand here and talk to us today, that's what he would tell you. It ain't me. I've seen the guy. <laughs> it's him. You need to focus on him. Amen. The Savior is real. He has come. Now we have to believe and live accordingly that that Savior has built the building and He has come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father,
thank you for your servant Moses. We, we just touched on the beginning, just his birth, that's it. One little small piece of this, this great servant of yours life, just his birth. And Father, in his birth, we see your son. We see that you set up the whole story to give us an idea of what was coming. Father, help us to see your son in scripture. Every time we open it, every time we read, let us see Jesus. For he is the builder of this church. He is the builder of the church. And he is the one to be praised. And he is the only one that can bring us into your house. That can bring us into your promised land to live forever. So that we may worship you forever. Father God, we thank you. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the gift of Moses and his story and how it just points us again right back to your plan, to that proto-evangelion, to that, that promise you made to Adam and Eve that you would crush that serpent's head. And because of that, we can live. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your Holy Spirit has brought it to life in a whole fresh way. We thank you for all of this. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Do you, uh, uh, Ophelia, what, what was your nephew's name? Yeah, Ophelia's nephew got thrown out of the back of a pickup, and she just found out at three days in a coma. So she wanted us to cry for it, and I just really had to keep it. All right, well, let's talk to God right now. Let's don't waste any time. Heavenly Father, oh, Miss Ophelia, she is one of your just great servants. Father God, she calls on your name boldly to her entire family. And her family has suffered so much. There has just been tragedy after tragedy. Father, if, if you're calling this family to you, let them see your hand in this. Let them see your face. Father God, let them see the God of their grandmother, Miss Ophelia, that is a God of love and mercy. Father God, we know nothing other than what we've heard this evening, but we bring this young man to you again for one purpose and one purpose only, that your name would be honored and praised for all time. Father God, we... We hope that he recovers. We pray for that. But we pray for the entire family to see you even in this time of darkness and despair. For you are light. And you are the light of this world. You are the light of that young man's life. Father God, we turn this all to you. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>
mountain that saves from sin.